That's exactly how it went down, but... Hey, I'm excited that you're here today. We start our summer series. We do this every year. Is during the summer, we have a series uh, that will go through the entire summer and usually spend it in a particular book of the Bible or section of the Bible. And uh, this summer, we're spending the summer in Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, I'm excited about getting into this. A really exciting, uh, some exciting stories packed in this chapter. Before we get to that, I, uh, I read a story one time of Joshua Chamberlain. Maybe you've heard of him. He was a student of theology and a, a professor of rhetoric. But he was not only uh, a scholar and a teacher, he was a soldier during the Civil War. And he climbed the ranks uh, through his uh, company. He began to climb the ranks and he attained the, the title of the colonel of the 20th Regiment of the Main Volunteer, Voluntary Infantry Division in the Union Army. And on July the 2nd of 1863, Chamberlain had about 300 men under his command and they were uh, all that stood between the Confederates and the, the, the battlefield at Gettysburg, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. At 2.30 in the afternoon, the 15th and the 47th Regiment of the Alabama Infantry, the, the Confederate Army, they charged Chamberlain and his men. And Chamberlain had a little high spot of ground, and he held his ground with his men, but they took heavy casualties. And as they took these casualties and, and they began to, to take care of the wounded, they soon discovered that they only had 80 men left in his regiment. And as these 80 men were there hunkered down on this hill behind these, this rock barrier, they began to notice that the, the, the Confederate army began to charge again, and they charged the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time, and the fifth time. And by this time, he was down to his 80 men, and each man had one round of ammunition left. And suddenly, the scout reported back to Chamberlain, and he said that the Confederates are, are gathering their ranks. They're beginning uh, setting stage to charge us again, and he knew he only, they only had one round of ammunition per soldier and 80 soldiers left. So he knew he had to do something. He had to do something decisively. So this 32-year-old school teacher got up on top of the rock barrier that they had been hiding on and drew his sword, and he gave the command to charge. And at that command, the 80 soldiers that were left went over the rock wall, began charging down the hill toward the Confederate army. It caught them so off guard and by, uh, caused so much confusion and chaos among their ranks that this one decision, looking back now, they say that this probably ranked as one of the most improbable military victories in the history of war, that 80 Union soldiers captured 4,000 Confederate soldiers in five minutes. Wow. And the historians believe if Chamberlain hadn't charged, then the Confederates would have gained the high ground, which meant they probably would have won the Battle of Gettysburg, which means they would have ultimately won the war. After the war, Chamberlain served as the 32nd governor of Maine and the president of Bowdoin College, and shortly after that, he was awarded a Medal of Honor from President Grover Cleveland. But what struck me the most about Chamberlain's story was a statement that he made years later reflecting on the war. And he wrote these words. He said, I had deep within me the inability to do nothing. I knew I may die, but I also knew I would not die with a bullet in my back. Wow. Wow. I love stories like this of, of courage. Throughout history, we don't remember the people who thought about doing something great, but we remember the people who actually did something great. People who defied the odds, people who took risks, people who, who courageously stepped out in faith. I love to hear the stories, and I love to read about the stories of these kind of people and their faith and their courage that they exhibited. In fact, there's a whole chapter in the Bible devoted to these kind of people. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 11 and beginning in verse 1. Listen to this. 
Faith means being sure of the things we hope for and knowing that something is real, even though we don't see it. Faith is the reason we remember great people who lived in the past. And if you go on in this chapter, he specifically lists 16 different people by name and some of the most courageous acts ever performed in history of people that just defied the odds and they said, you know, I'm going to have faith regardless of what I see or the circumstances. I'm just going to have faith and I'm going to believe. And we read their stories. In fact, when you get through with the 16 people that he lists specifically, he finally sums it up with this. And he says there's so many more, there's too many more to mention in this chapter. And then if you drop down to verse 39 of that chapter, it says God was pleased with them all because of their faith. Because of their faith. And our Bibles today are broken up into chapters. This is something that man did to kind of, to, to, to kind of segment stuff in the Bible. But most of the scriptures are, are designed to be read straight through. So when you get to this in the end of chapter 11, it just continually flows right into chapter 12. And verse 12 says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a large crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sins that so easily trip us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. He said we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Who is this great crowd and who are these witnesses? It's the people we've just read about in chapter 11. All the great heroes of the faith. And he said they're like a grandstand and they're just up there and they're witnesses to what we're doing and the race that we're running. They've already run their race. They're up in the stands. They've got victory and they're like, you know, high five and all this kind of stuff. So they're already there. They've won their race. And he says now this group of people are witnesses to us and the life of faith that we live in the race that we run. So over the next few weeks, we're going to learn from some of these people. We're going to learn as we run our race of faith. We're going to pull some people out of this crowd. And we're going to invite them down and say, hey, run a lap with us around the track. Just, just spend some time with us and let's just run a, a lap together and let's just hear some of their wisdom. Let's hear some of their insight. Let's hear what they would have to say to us as we run our race of faith. So as we're getting ready to run around the track, all of a sudden we see this guy come out of the stands, an older guy, and he's coming down out of the stands and, and he starts jogging up beside us as we're running our race. And as he gets up closer to us, we go, hmm, I recognize this guy. I know this guy. I recognize him from the movie, The Ten Commandments. It's Charleston Heston. You know, and we recognize who it is. Well, it's really not him, but it's Moses. We go, yeah, I've read about this guy. I know this guy. I've read him from Scripture. And so Moses comes jogging up beside us. And his speech isn't that good, but he begins to talk. And I believe if he could talk, maybe he could have talked about the incredible events of his life, like the burning bush out in the desert, or he could have talked about the plagues in, 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 in Egypt. He could have talked about parting the Red Wouldn't that be a great story? Let me tell you how I, I parted this Red Sea, and God parted it for us, and let me tell you that story. He could have told us a lot of stories. Water from the rock in the desert. Manna that just miraculously came out of heaven to feed them every day. Or he could have talked about the Ten Commandments. I was on the mountain with God, and he wrote out these commandments and gave us a lot of stuff he could have talked about. But I believe if we were to have pulled Moses out of the crowd and say, would you run with us? Would you share a little bit with us? I don't know, and this is just me, but I kind of believe maybe he would say something like this. Yeah, you want some experience? You want me to tell you something about faith? Here it is. Live in the faith zone, not the safe zone. Live in the faith zone and not the safe zone. You see, every person's story, your story and my story, it is written in risk. The risks that we took and the ones that we didn't take. We, we wouldn't know uh, Moses' story unless he had taken a risk, unless he had stepped out, unless he had got out of the safe zone and lived in the faith zone. You know, if we talk to him, he may say something like, you know, my greatest moment was the, 
was the, the day that I, I encountered God at a burning bush. It was so powerful, so real. I actually took my shoes off because I was just like, it was holy place, this holy ground. And that was probably one of the greatest moments in my life. And the decision I made there at that burning bush that day, that decision wrote the next 40 years of my life story. And though that decision brought me daily encounters with God, it, it wasn't easy. And that's the thing here that we need to understand is faith. Faith is never easy. It's never easy. It always involves risk. There's always risk. For Moses, going back to Egypt was a huge risk because he was a fugitive. He was wanted by the Egyptians. Opposing Pharaoh was a big risk for him. Crossing the Red Sea, that was a big risk. Listening to over two million people complain and whine every single day, there was a lot of risk involved. And, and possessing the promised land and all the giants that lived there, that was a big risk. And here's the thing. Following Christ involves risk. We say, oh, well, I, I want to be a Christian because it, everything should be good and everything should be rosy and everybody should love me. And just, you know, that's why I want to be a Christian. No, being a Christ follower involves risk. In fact, every time you exercise faith, it involves risk. Moses goes on to describe the risk that he had to overcome in order to move from the safe zone to the faith zone. First one was this, he had to overcome experiences of his past. He had to overcome experiences from his past because the Hebrew people were growing so great in number in Egypt. Suddenly Pharaoh says, they're going to outnumber us before this is all over. So Pharaoh issued a decree and he said, look, we're going we're to kill every newborn male Hebrew child. I want everyone that is born, you take them and you throw them in the Nile River. And that was the decree. So all these children were being tossed into the Nile River in order to eliminate the, uh, eliminate the population of the Hebrew people. So more, Moses is born into this atmosphere. He's, he's born into a period of uncertainty. And his mother decides, you know... I can't throw him into the, the river. He, he's beautiful and he's special and God has given him. To, I can't do that. So she weaves a basket out of weeds and she places her child, Moses, in this basket and sets him out into the Nile River. And to this day, he probably told everyone, hey, yeah, I was a real basket case when I was a kid. Just had to throw that in there. He was taken by Pharaoh's daughter who found him in the weeds, and, and she took him as her, as her own, and he lived a life of comfort and ease. He was the grandson of Pharaoh, okay? He was the prince of Egypt. He had the best of everything, the best food, the best entertainment, the best uh, uh, education. He had it all, and he grew up in a safe place. He was in the palace of the Pharaoh of Egypt. He wanted for nothing. But here was the problem. Though he was raised Egyptian, he was still Hebrew at heart. There was still something in him that he wanted to identify with God's people. So when he turns 40, he's living in the safe zone, and suddenly he realized he's, there's a chance for him to take a risk. And he tried to do something big for his own people. And one day he encountered an Egyptian out that was beating a Hebrew, and he went to the aid of the Hebrew, and he killed the Egyptian, and he looked around to make sure no one was looking, and he drug the Egyptian over and buried him in the sand and thought, you know, nobody will see. And he thought he did a good thing. I took a big risk for the Hebrew people. In fact, the Scripture says this, by faith, Moses, went, when he had grown up, he refused to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. In other words, what he's saying here is he decided to leave the safe zone of being an Egyptian and enter the faith zone of being a Hebrew, a child of God. And the result was Pharaoh wanted to kill him. When Pharaoh found out, he said, he has to die. So Moses flees Egypt and everything he's ever known, all the comforts he's ever known, he has to leave and attempt to, 
to, to get out of the safe zone because he knows if he stays there, he's a fugitive and he'll die. They'll catch him and they will kill him. So he leaves the safe zone. And the writer goes on to say this about Moses. It said that by faith, he left Egypt. By faith, he got out of his safe zone. And when I think about that, I think that's where most of us live today, isn't it? Our biggest battle is leaving Egypt. Our biggest battle is leaving our safe zone because it involves risk. It involves a risk of faith. It's tough because we're born and we're bred to play it safe, aren't we? Don't we teach that to our kids? Play it safe. You know, just hold on to what you got. Just, just be safe. And we, we're inbreded with that. We're, we're taught that. Stuff keeps a lot of us in Egypt. And, it, and, and, and from seeing what God can really do and the miraculous things He can do in our life because we're playing it safe. We like comfortable. We like familiar. And then we complain about never seeing God do anything miraculous. Or we complain that, you know, we, just, we don't ever see the spectacular happen in our life because we're playing it safe. Or maybe we did take a risk. Maybe we did step out in faith. Maybe we did say, hey, I'm going to step out of my safe zone and I'm going to do this and we did it and it didn't work out the way we thought it was going to work out and it, and it kind of flopped and so we decided, you know, I ain't doing that again. I'm going to get right back over here in the safe zone and I'm just going to play it safe. I love a quote that I came across. I don't even know who wrote it, but it says this, we live by faith or we do not live at all. Either we venture or we vegetate, we risk, or we rust. We risk, or we rust. In order for Moses to live in the faith zone, he had to overcome the experiences of his past. Second thing, he had to overcome the comforts of his present. Okay, Moses flees Egypt. He goes out into the Midian desert. He finds a man out there and... and and, and starts working for him by the name of Jethro. And Moses' motto has been like, been there, done that, ain't doing it again. I'm happy right here in the desert with my sheep. And he's watching sheep for Jethro. He meets one of Jethro's daughters. They get married. They have kids. And suddenly this becomes a safe zone for Moses. He's like, he's happy. He's out there tending sheep. He's a part of the family now. Because there was no heir, no son to Jethro. Moses is heir to inherit everything that he has. I mean, who would want to leave that? He's forged a new life for himself. It wasn't a palace life, but it was a safe. It was a comfortable life. He had left Egypt, and forever he was at a safe place, he thought, now, I'm good. But God called Moses one day through a burning bush, and he spoke to Moses, and he said, I want you to leave this comfortable situation. I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to be my spokesman and my people's deliverer. So next, Moses had to overcome the insecurities of the future. He was going back to a place that he didn't want to go. He was going back to a place where he was a wanted man. God said, I want you to go back. He felt totally unqualified to go back. He was like, you know, I, I left, left Egypt. I'm not going back. Just leave me alone. He was insecure about himself. He was insecure about his future. I mean, listen to some of the quotes that he made when God told him to go back. He said, who am I that I should go? What shall I say to them when I get there? But suppose they won't believe me when I tell them. And then he says, and I'm really slow of speech. I don't speak very well. Every time Moses raised an objection, God would answer with an affirmative. And still Moses finally gives up arguing with God. And he says, okay, Lord, just... Please, send someone else. I don't want to go. Just send someone else. And then the Scripture says God becomes angry with Moses. But unfortunately, he didn't give up on him, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. So God says, I'm going to send your brother, Aaron, and he'll be your spokesman. He'll speak for you. So Moses agrees to go and answer God's call and leave his safe zone and go back into Egypt. And as a result of that, you know the story. The children of Israel are delivered from bondage. Miraculous things happen. All the plagues, the parting of the, the whole story hinged on Moses saying, yes, I'll get out of my safe zone and live in the faith zone. Interesting story that you can read 
there. But the, what I want to get to this morning is just a, a, two or three takeaways from this story of Moses. And, and the first one is this. We don't naturally leave the safe zone, do we? We don't naturally leave a safe zone. It's interesting. You read about a mother eagle, and she'll take those babies. She'll, she'll protect them. She'll feed them. She'll nurture them. She's got them all huddled up in the nest under her wings, and she's just being a great mom and, you know, just taking care of those little baby eaglets. And all of a sudden, there comes a point when she'll take those little babies in her beak, and she'll take them out of the nest and go, ah, lets them go. And we think, oh, that's awful. How, how harsh, how mean, how heartless of a mother to take her baby eagle and drop them out of the nest and let them fall. But what she's doing is she's teaching that eagle how to fly. Because she knows that if they, they stay in that nest, they'll stay in there the rest of their life. They'll never get out. So she forces them to get out of the nest. Mo Moses probably didn't want to leave Egypt. It was all he had ever known. But had he not left Egypt, he had never experienced God at a burning bush. And then while he's in the desert, he probably thought, this is all I want right here. Just give me these sheep. Just give me all this, this space out here. I'm fine. Yet if he had not left the desert, he would have never seen a, a sea part. He would have never seen God's people delivered. He had never been able to talk to God face to face. Just because you don't want to do something doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. And here's what I've discovered. Is that God will often make us uncomfortable to get us out of the safe zone and into the faith zone. Oh, would God do that? You know, God is supposed to be peace and love and everything's great and rosy. Would God do that? Yes, God would do that. He would make us uncomfortable enough that we would get out of our safe zone and into the faith zone. You say, well, why would he do that? Because of this. Growth begins when we leave the safe zone. When we leave the safe zone, we begin to grow. Moses had benefited from everything Egypt had to offer. But it was only after he left Egypt that he began to learn what was really Important. It took another 40 years in the desert to discover what God intended for him to do and who he intended for him to be. And by then, Moses had been broken. He had been remade. He had been humbled by God. The desert training that he had, watching those sheep, it prepared Moses to navigate in the desert and to know all the watering spots out there in the desert because pretty soon he was going to be leading people through that same desert. Being out in the desert watching the sheep, it taught Moses not only how to to, to tend far and care for sheep, but it was going to teach him how to tend far and care for God's people as he led them. You can't stay the same and learn at the same time. If you want to, if you want to grow, you've got to go. I love a statement I read. It said, God can't steer parked cars. We have to move. I read another deal I thought was really good. It said, there's no such thing as a correspondence course for swimming. Think about that. There's no such thing as a correspondence course for swimming. I mean, at some point, you got to get in the water. Okay? You got to get in water and you got to be able to swim. What I have found, and, and this may be you as well, but what I found personally is this the greatest growth moments in my life have been birthed out of crisis and transition. Looking back on my life, those have been the greatest growth moments in my life. I remember being diagnosed with a particular sickness, was sick for, for three to four weeks, had lost 20-something pounds, didn't know what was happening to me. I thought I was dying. Spending a week in the hospital, but I, after I got through that, looked back and I realized God taught me so much during that period in my life. He showed Himself to me in so such a real way during those periods in my life. I remember when my father was sick over a period of time and eventually passed away. It was a crisis time for me, but I realized that God used that time 
that I grew, I grew out of that. I, there were moments of growth for me as I walked through that and realized God was walking with me and God was saying, hey, I'm sorry, you've got to go through this, but I'm going to walk with you and here's some things I want you to learn and take away from this and walk out of here stronger than when you walked into it. There were other times, financial crisis we've been through. Many times I've looked and the greatest moments of growth in my life have come out of times of crisis or transition. And that's probably what James was saying when he said, you know that under pressure your faith life is forced into the open and it shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not, def uh, not with a deficit in any way, deficiency in any way. He said, let it grow. Let these times grow you and mature you. He goes on to say in that same chapter, he says, the trying of your faith produces. It produces. Let your faith life do its work so that we're well matured and well developed. And the last thing I think we can take from this is the safe zone robs us of some of our greatest moments and greatest memories. I, I don't know, but I have a vivid imagination and I can just imagine what it must have been like to sit around Moses' dinner table with the kids and the grandkids and the great-grandkids. And him saying, did I ever tell you all about the, the sea part? Oh, yeah, Gramps, we've heard it a hundred times, you know. Or, or did I tell, hey, did I tell you all about the, the food coming down from heaven? Great memories, great moments happen when we step out of the safe zone. I remember as a 20-year-old, I was enrolled in Texas Tech University, having the time of my life. I thought I had my plan laid out of what I wanted to do and was just having a ball and my parents up and moved from Lubbock, Texas to of all places Eufaula, Alabama. My dad took a church here and they needed a student pastor. I was torn. I was like, yeah, I'm happy right where I'm at. I'm happy right here. But through a process, I finally just, okay, I'd like to be in student ministry. And I came. I left a safe zone and entered a faith zone in my life. So many different things that I look back on. I look back on when we started this church. I was in a safe place. I was in a safe zone. And starting this church was scary. It just, it was scary, but it was something in my heart that I knew I wanted to do, had to do. It was stepping out of a safe zone into a faith zone. And I thank God every day of my life that I took that step of faith and followed God into the faith zone. Many people are so afraid of risks that they spend their entire lives in Egypt. They spend their entire lives in that safe zone. And God has always invited people out of the safe zone into a, a faith zone. We read it over and over and over again. In fact, we'll cover it this summer out of the Hebrews 11 of where He'd just call people and He'd say, hey, you want to you wanna really live? You, 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 you're happy right there in your little safe spot, but if you really want to live, you really want to soar, I'm inviting you to come over here into the faith zone and live by faith. He did it all throughout Scripture. Peter, the disciples, they were out on a boat in the middle of a storm. And the boat's rocking and the waves are coming over the side and Jesus comes walking across the water in the wee hours of the morning toward them. And Peter pops up out of the boat and, and it's interesting the statement he makes. He says, Lord, if it's really You, then he said, invite me to come out there and join You. And Jesus says, come on. Translated, Jesus said, leave the safe boat and come out here in the faith zone. We've read the story. We've talked about before. Peter climbs over the side of the boat and he starts walking on water. He is walking on water. And we go, yeah, yeah, but you know, Peter sank. He started, he had to go, Lord, save me. You know, he, he sank. And yeah, but hey, he walked on water. 
How many of you this morning can say you have walked on water? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. If Peter was here, he'd be out there going like, Me! <laughs> I did it! I, you know, I sunk, yeah, but I walked on water. Why? Because he got out of the safe zone and he got into the faith zone. It's by faith we must leave our comfort zone. If we want to enjoy God's blessing, we want to enjoy God doing incredible things in and through our lives, we have to get out of the safe zone. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the risk you didn't take than by the ones that you did. So I have a question to leave with you this morning, and it's simply this. Where have you been living in the safe zone? Where are you living in the safe zone? What is it you know God is calling you to do? What is it you know God is nudging you toward, and you just can't seem to take that risk? Maybe He's nudging you to serve. Maybe you've been coming to this church for months, maybe years, maybe you've just started a couple of weeks ago and you felt a nudge that I, I really would like to help in this area. I'd really like to serve here. I really feel like I could contribute here. This is where my gift is at. This is what I do well. I really feel like I could plug in here. But you're sitting in your safe zone and you're going, I'd love to do that, but I don't know that I can commit the time. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know, and we start slowly gravitating back to our safe zone. Where are you living in the safe zone? And where's God calling you out? Maybe it's serving somewhere. Maybe it's getting more connected. Maybe it's plugging in and getting connected in a small group or a small relationship here and, and, and get connected with people and start interacting with people. Maybe He's calling you to that and you're just like, I'm just going to stay in my little safe zone. Don't bother me. I won't bother you. And, and, and then... We just withdraw, and God has said, hey, come on, there's people I want you to meet. There's people I want you to, to get in relationship. There's people who can pour into your life. There's people that you can pour into their lives. But it'll never happen sitting in the safe zone. Maybe God is calling you out to share your faith. Maybe He's saying, hey, I want you to share your faith. I want you to talk to that neighbor. I want you to talk to that guy you work with or that gal you work with. I want you to share your faith with another student that you, that you love and you have a friendship with. I want you to, I'm going to call you out a little bit further and I want you to get out of your safe zone and I want you to live in the faith zone and see what I will do in this area of your life. Maybe it's in your giving. Maybe God's calling you and nudging you toward giving. Maybe it's in your job or whatever, but you know God is nudging you toward something and we're like, putting our heels in because we're safe, we're comfortable, and we don't want to mess anything up. And God said, hey, if you really want to live, if you really want to experience life the way I created you to experience, you've got to get out of the safe zone. Live in the faith zone. Not the safe zone. I just thought this week is, is getting ready and band can go ahead and come on.